This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. On page 18, we have five bullet points from the end. And we're in the area of termination of offer. If I make an offer, but there is a condition attached to the offer, that is, if something happens, then I will offer. If the something doesn't happen, if this condition which precedes the offer or is an integral element of the offer, if this condition precedent does not take place, then of course the offer doesn't exist, so it's terminated. Notice of revocation of an offer within the termination and bringing about the revocation. You see the top two points may be revoked at any time and revocation must be communicated. The notice and the way in which you communicate to the offeree may be through a reliable third party. So I may make an offer and then without seeing the offeree again, I ask somebody else to communicate with the offeree uh, then that notification of revocation is effective. So I can ask someone to give notice of revocation, or if the offeree hears that I have revoked my offer and has no question, no reason to question the validity of what he has heard, are you all right? Uh, then that would be good communication of revocation. And we have the case Dickinson and Dodds, which was about a house sale. Dodds is selling his house. Uh, the offer is made and Dickinson says he would like to buy it. But he needs some time to think about it. And Dodds says, well, don't worry about it. Let me know by the latest Friday morning in writing with a letter through my letterbox. This was Monday. On Tuesday, Dodds meets somebody else, a man called Alan. And Alan says, I'll buy your house. I'll buy it now. I've made my mind up. I want the house. So Dodds agrees to sell the house to Alan, having already made an offer and had a sort of acceptance from Dickinson and given Dickinson some time to think about it. Alan buys the house. He's in the bar at night. Dickinson hears about this house having been sold to Alan by Dodds and realizes it's the same house that he was thinking about buying. So he immediately writes out a letter of acceptance, puts it in an envelope, puts it through the letterbox of Dodds, and claims that he has a contract, and that therefore Dodds has to, pl has to supply him with another <coughs> similar house. And it gets to court, and the court says, why did you leave it, or what did you do, and how did you hear about the house sale? He said, I heard from this man called Alan that he had bought the house. Well, that surely is communication of revocation. The offer no longer exists. The item which was available for sale has now been sold to someone else. But we do have a little problem there, and that is that in the original inverted commas agreement between Dodds and Dickinson, Dodds had promised Dickinson that he would let Dickinson have time to think about it before he committed himself to the contract. This is called an option period. And an option period was granted. An option period had been granted to Dickinson to give him time to think about whether he wanted to make the final decision and, and, and buy the house. Is that option period enforceable? Can we insist that Dodds should honor the option period offer? If I promise to, or I invite you, I offer to sell you my car for 400, don't answer straight away. Think about it and let me know by the end of the month. Can you insist that if you accept by the end of the month, you should have the car? Was that no? Maybe no? Should I ask Mara? <laughs> yes, I should ask Mara. <laughs> no, Artos is right. No, 
he cannot insist that I should keep the offer open. The reason is this. We've actually got two contracts here. We've got the offer of the sale of the car in exchange for £400. We have, in addition, another contract. I will give you something of value. I will give you time to think about whether you want to make your mind up one way or another. What did you give me in exchange for me giving you that time? Nothing. And a contract is an agreement supported by consideration, two-way consideration made with intention. If you don't pay me in exchange for me giving you that option period, you cannot insist upon that option period. If you do pay me to buy this extra time to think about it, then I have to honour that option period. And if I don't, I'm in breach of contract and I would have to compensate you. I would have to provide you with, in the context of a car, I would have to provide you with a similar car, similar age, condition, make, model, mileage, kilometerage. So if I have granted you an option period and you have paid for it, for me giving you this extension of time, then you can insist that I should honour that. Uh, that second contract as well as the first. Counter offer. This goes back to the fifth bullet point on the page, rejection, hide and wrench. I told you that hide and wrench was the sale of a farm. A farm is offered for sale. There's the farm title documents. There is the farm available for sale, £1,000. Hyde turned to wrench and said, no, I'll give you 950 so the offer of the farm for a thousand was retracted and 950 was put on the table instead. And Wrench said, no, I don't want your 950. And the offer for 950 is gone. So now there's no offer. So Hyde now turns around and says, okay, I'll give you the full thousand. And Wrench said, no, there's no offer. There's nothing left on the table available to be accepted. So if you reject, and instead of just rejecting, you make another offer in its place, if that other offer is rejected, there's no, no offer left available. And that's called a counter-offer, which is the third bullet point up. A counter-offer. I offer to sell you, so I offer to sell you my car for 400 If you turn around and say 350 and I say no, then you can't, well you can, but you have no effect, you can't turn around and insist that I should sell it now for 400 You've rejected my original 400 offer, it no longer exists. So counter-offer. And a counter-offer takes place, effectively, if you think about it, a counter-offer takes place whenever an offer is made and the offeree, in their inverted commas, acceptance, changes any element of the offer. Now I understand, I've only understood recently, it really has to be a material change to the, any element of the offer. If it's an insignificant change, it doesn't matter. But if it's a material change to the original terms of the original offer, then it's not an acceptance. It is in fact rejection and counter-offer. Are you alright? Are you lost? You're lost. Where did you get lost? Don't say nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> no. Have you been drinking? It's just, it's just... Where are you lost, Julia? I don't like losing people because if I lose you, you lose interest and it's a fascinating subject and you mustn't lose interest. Okay, I will keep an interest in it. Yeah. Dry. You're dry? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Down the bottom of 18, the bottom two points, acceptance. That's the end of the offer. If an offer is on the table and it's now accepted, the offer no longer exists. It's now converted into part of an agreement. And so long as that's supported by consideration and made with intention, the offer now becomes an integral element of the contract. Yep. And refusal. Refusal to accept. Buy my car for £400. Buy my car for 400 No. Nope. Nope, nope, I refuse to accept. That's almost the same as as rejection. If I try to insist that you should buy something from me and you refuse, 
then that's what we have at the bottom there, refusal. It's effectively rejection. I'm on to page 19, and we're talking at greater length about offers. What's the difference between an offer and an invitation to treat? What's the difference between an offer and an invitation to treat? Ganuta. What's the difference, Madra, difference between an offer and an invitation? There's no difference. Well, actually, there is quite an essential difference. Benita, Sandra, ladies, gentlemen, where have you been? Difference between an offer, Linda, an offer and an invitation. Agreement? Yeah, agreement can come into your answer. I can put the word agreement into a sentence explaining the difference. Yes, you're right. Vita, an invitation is inviting somebody to make an offer, whereas an offer is a, a, exists in its own right. An invitation cannot be accepted. If I invite you to a party, you can't accept that. Well, actually you can. It's a different sort of invitation, isn't it? But an invitation to enter into a contract is not, is not completed when you say, yes, okay, I, I accept. You can't accept an invitation in the context of company law and contract law. But you can accept an offer. The essential difference is that invitation leads to the agreement, whereas an offer is part of the agreement. Give me examples of invitations which people thought were offers. Give me examples where uh, something is in fact an invitation, even though you may have thought it was an offer. Goods on a supermarket shelf, yeah, goods on a supermarket shelf would be. And even though, you know, when you see, occasionally you go into a supermarket and there's a price tag underneath the, underneath the, the rack of goods and it says instead, they've made a mistake, instead of saying five pounds, it says 50 pence. So you think, well, this is a good bargain, I'm going to take two or three of these. Can you insist that they sell these goods to you at 50 pence? No. Why? Now I asked you first. Because it's only an invitation. It's inviting. The price indicated on goods in a supermarket is an indication of the sort of level of price that the supermarket is prepared to accept if you go along and make an offer. So a packet of cornflakes, 50 pence. I'm giving you an idea of the sort of value you should offer me to buy these cornflakes from me. So you go along and, and I put it through the scanner and the scanner says one pound forty and you say no 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 it's only fifty pence according to the shelf see you offer me fifty pence and I'm saying no I'm going to reject your offer of fifty pence and I put a counter offer you can buy those cornflakes for one pound forty and then you accept it don't you so the price of goods on a supermarket shelf is merely an indication it's not intended that this should be an offer in its own right it's just an invitation and an indication of the sort of price level you should be offering. So you can't insist, even though they've radically made a mistake with the price. Instead of five pounds and fifty pence, if it should be five hundred pounds and they've put fifty pence, uh, then that may be more clear that this is clearly not a, an offer available to be accepted. Give me another example of when an invitation may be confused with an offer. Tell me again. An advert in a newspaper, and even though it says offer for sale, it's not an offer for sale. Adverts are normally, 99% of the time, adverts are going to be invitations rather than offers. But there isn't it. What was the case where there was an advert which was taken to be an offer? There are actually three cases, but one was a big one. Who? In the war? In the reward situation, I thought you said in the war, in a reward situation. Was there, wasn't there a case? It's in your car list twice. Carlil and Carbolic. And the basic product within the case was what? Smoking balls. Yes, yeah, smoke balls. 
um, so smoke balls where an advert was taken to be um, an offer. Unusually, most rarely, there were two other cases in the same area. What were they? Where an advert in a reward situation. R and Clark, yeah, R and Clark was one. The other one? The other one? The vengeful, beaten up girlfriend. Williams and Carwardine. You know, I'm expecting, I, I may be disappointed, I may be disappointed, but I'm expecting you to be going through these law notes this evening, just going through them again, and reminding yourself and listening to the stories and thinking about the principles of law which are attached to all these cases. All these cases establish a principle of law. That's why they're cases and that's why they're in these notes and that's why they're in study texts. It's because they establish a principle. So, if you can remember the case, you can remember the principle. And it's more easy to remember a case and a story than it is to remember some cold, bare statement of a principle of law. Silence cannot be acceptance. But if I tell you about the man and his horse, you'll remember that. Possibly. So I'm expecting you to go through this this evening. Whatever plans you did have, I presume you've already cancelled them. Yes, Mike. Offers. We're into offers, top of page 19. Half of the agreement. Why is this important? Define contract. A, a definition of contract does not begin with two parties. Define contract. Linda? is two elements of one word. What does offer plus acceptance equal? The agreement. So a contract is an agreement. Supported by by it's an agreement supported by Consideration made with intention to create legal relief. Well done. Well remembered. It's an agreement supported by consideration made with intention. The first key element of that definition is the word agreement. Agreement is made up of two elements. There may be a third element to begin with, but then we have the two elements which create the agreement. The two elements which create an agreement are what? Mara. Offer and acceptance. What's the third element which may come before the offer? An invitation. Yeah? How much of this did you know at nine o'clock this morning? Can we get somewhere close to zero? Now, just imagine now how much more you know just as a result of half a day. Can we get somewhere close to zero? <laughs> it's repetition. Repetition is what you need. Repeat. Go over and over and over and over again and again and again. What I'm telling you, the notes, the, the, the bullet points in these course notes, reading the study text, if there's an area which I've told you to cover because I'm not going to cover the background of the English legal system, the structure and hierarchy of the courts, read it. Time and time again. And by the time you've read it two or three times, it's like reading a novel. You know what's coming next. If you read a novel twice, you know the end part. You know who, who did the killing. You can virtually remember the verbatim, the words which were spoken by the characters in the novel. If you read your study text, just the bits which I'm not covering, at least the bits that I'm not covering, you will find it becomes familiar to you. It becomes easy. Otherwise, it is hard. It's a tough exam. For, for some of... Uh, I don't know. Over worldwide, it's 50-ish, I think. It's, it's either mid-40s to early 50s, normally. Um, where was I? No, we're not part of the agreement. I'm after that. I'm trying to motivate. I'm, doing a bit, I'm in the middle of a motivational speech. <laughs> Um, over and over and over. I 
said that. I was where, Peter? Reading the study text. Reading the study text, yeah. I'm reading the study text for the bits that I'm not going to cover. And by the time you've read the study text section two or three times, you are familiar with what it says. But you will need to do it. It's, that's where I got to. This is a tough exam. That's where I was. I was looking at Sandra and saying, this is a tough exam. It's not easy. Um, and particularly, it's not easy in a foreign language. And with all these foreign characters and foreign names involved, it, it's hard, and you will have to work. For some, that's what I was going to say. For some of you, this is going to be your first ACCA exam. And really, you should mentally brace yourself for three hours of hell. Because that's what you're facing. <laughs> Dismiss it. And then in August, you'll say, oh, I wish I'd listened to Mike. Half of the agreement, page 19, is an offer. Half of the agreement. The other half of the agreement is acceptance. And an offer is defined as being an expression of willingness to be bound on specific terms. Specific, very detailed terms. I will make you an offer to sell my car tomorrow for £400. And I can put a condition there. I can say on condition that the snow doesn't fall uh, tomorrow morning. I can put whatever conditions in there. But it's an offer to be bound. It's an expression of willingness to be bound on specific terms. And it must be certain. And we've got a case there called Gumthing and Lynn. I've never heard, I've never come across a person called Gumthing. I have never met a person called Gumthing. I do know people who are called Lynn because Lynn is a, a woman's name in the UK. But Gumthing, you can remember Gumthing easily. Because if you go out of school last year, up to Larch Placer, and turn right on Larch Placer, there's a, there's a shop on the right-hand side called Lierotchu. And what do they sell? Gun. Gun, and other things. They sell gun things. Uh, so you can remember gun thing easily enough, can't you? The gun thing and Lynn. This is about a horse, a buying and selling of a horse. I'll pay you £100 to buy the horse, and the agreement is, well, somebody says they will sell it for £100. Uh, but if the horse is lucky, then another £50 will become payable. Define lucky. What's, what, what does a lucky horse look like? One that's all, that still has all four legs, I presume, and, and both ears are still intact. And a, how do you define lucky horse? Well, you can't. It's uncertain. There's no alley. If it comes first in a race, does that mean it's lucky? Well, no, it doesn't because it didn't come first in the next race and therefore it's not that lucky, is it? So it's uncertain. And therefore this extra £50 never became payable. The seller said it had been lucky. The buyer said, no, that's not what I call luck must still exist when it's accepted. In order that an offer is accepted and then becomes an agreement, the offer must exist at the moment the act of acceptance is effected. If the offer is no longer on the table, it cannot be accepted. must be distinguished from invitations. Well, we've done endlessly. We've, we've distinguished offers from invitations. What are those four similarish words? where we distinguished invitations from offers. What were the four cases, the four words? Boots, balls, birds, and ding-dong, <coughs> bells. What was the ding-dong case? What sort of weapon was involved? Who's the, who's the president of your national airline? F flick knife, the flick knife case. And I nearly wrote it down wrong, if you remember. Offers must be distinguished from statements of intent. Harrison Nickerson is the case. This is a case about an advert or a statement that we were going to hold an auction. An auction will be held next Friday, 10 o'clock, in business school. That's the intention. It's not an offer. And if I choose to cancel the auction, if I say, even if you all turn up, I just say I'm not having an auction. You could have travelled hundreds of kilometers to come to this auction and when you arrive I say we're not having an auction after all you can't insist that there should be an auction it's a statement of intent it's not an offer because it's not an offer it can't be accepted so statements of intent 
are not offers. A re response to a request for information is not an offer. In case Harvey and Facey, this is in your, Harvey is a, a man's name in England. Harvey and Facey is about a plot of land, a piece of land in Jamaica. And the piece of land, if you ever wanted to know, the piece of land is called Bumper Hall Pen. Pen is the local Jamaican word for a plot of land. It's a, it's a defined so many hectares or aras or, or square meters. So Bumper Hall Pen was the plot of land which was the subject of this next series of, of communications. And a man in England communicated with the, the people in Jamaica and said, is Bumper Hall Pen for sale? If it is for sale, how much would it be? And the answer came back, Bumper Hall Pen, £4,000. And the answer went back to Jamaica, accepted. Do we have a contract? No, because all the Bumper Hall Pen, £4,000 was, was simply a response to a request for information. How much is, if it were for sale, how much would it be? If it were for sale, it would be £4,000, is effectively what the reply was. So a response to information, a request for information, is not an offer and therefore cannot be accepted. Similarly, a request for information is not itself an offer. It's not a counter-offer, I should say. A request for information is not a counter-offer. In the case Stevenson and McLean, this is also in your Christian name list. Stephen is a, a, name, a man's name in England. A request for information. This is about the sale of 3,000 tons of steel. And it was being sold by a Welsh company to an American company. And the deal was agreed, the offer was made by the Welsh company. The American company responded and said, accepted, can we pay in 30 days' time? And nothing happened. And eventually the Americans contacted the Welsh people and said, where's our steel? And the Welsh company said, you rejected our offer, you made a counter-offer and, and we've not accepted your counter-offer. You asked for 30-day payment, and that wasn't part of the original offer. And he said it was asked, can we pay in 30 days? It's a request for information. It's not itself a counter-offer. It's just a request. I accept it. Yes, we'll buy your steel. Is it all right if we pay in 30 days? It's not a counter-offer. It's just a request for information. Revocation. In the context of offers and acceptances, revocation. This case, Byrne and Van Tienhoven. Again, it's a, a contract for the, the sale of 3,000 tons of steel. You don't have to remember these quantities because they're probably wrong anyway. A request for, or it's a contract, a deal, a, um, an agreement about the purchase and sale of steel. It's actually pig iron, now I think about it. On the 1st of October, an offer is sent. It's sent by a um, British company to an American company, and it's a long time ago. So we're not talking emails, we're not talking telexes, not talking telegrams, we're going by ship. So an offer is made, an offer is sent. On the 8th of October, uh, a revocation of offer was sent. On the 11th, the offer was received. On the 15th, 
a letter of acceptance. On the 20th, revocation was received. Advise the parties. The question, do we have a contract? We do. It was revoked before the offer was even received. It has to be. For revocation to be effected, it has to be received. And until it is received, the offer is still alive. So the offer was alive until the 20th. Actually, it was alive until the 15th. It changed from being an offer on the 15th to being part of an agreement. Acceptance on the 15th made this offer into an agreement. And therefore, we have a contract with effect from the 15th. The notification of the revocation is not effective until it is actually received, until communicated to the offeree. So we do have a contract, even though within seven days of sending the offer, the seller wanted to reject it, wanted to revoke it. But yeah, we do have a contract. An offer may be made to the world at large, you know that. You know that, you know the case R and Clark. One word describing the main element of the case R and Clark. What was about to happen to Clark? He was going to be hanged or hung. He was going to be hung. The, the robber, the member of the gang. Williams and Carwardine, one word to explain what happened in Williams and Carwardine. Female. Female is enough, that's all you need. Female revenge, yes. Yeah, it's unnecessary use of words, isn't it? Either female or revenge would do to, to put both together. Carlin and Carbolic, two words to tell me all about Carlin and Carbolic. Arturs. <sighs> Smoke balls, snoring, influenza. Okay, page 20, this is the other half of the agreement. This is the acceptance of the agreement. Acceptance of the agreement, the other half. And the second bullet point tells us that acceptance must be complete and unconditional. You can't start introducing conditions. When somebody makes you an offer, you can't say, yes, okay, but I also want. Or, yes, okay, but on condition that. You can't start introducing new elements on top of the original offer. The effect of introducing the new elements is rejection of the original offer and replacing it with a counter offer. So you can't change the terms of the offer. Now, in global law, when looking at the uh, terms for international commercial trade, in global law, it does say that a change may be introduced if it doesn't have a material impact. So I'm thinking that it's not just any change which will be a counter-offer, it should be a material change. Which, but then, if it is a material change, that is rejection of the original and replacing it with a counter-offer. That third point then, acceptance cannot vary the original offer, that's a counter-offer. Northland Airlines and Dennis Ferranti Meters, this is a case about the sale of a helicopter. Dennis Ferranti Meters is selling a helicopter. They advertise it. It's available. It's offered for sale. It's an offer for sale. We will sell our helicopter for £30,000. Northland Airlines contacted them and said, 
We accept, but we want delivery in 30 days' time. And, and the original offer said, you can accept by paying money into a specified bank account. Northland Airlines said, yes, we accept. We want delivery in 30 days. They paid the money, but they paid it into a different bank account. Still the Bank of France meters, but not the one had, which had been specified. 30 days later, they contact Dennis Ferranti and say, where's our helicopter? And Dennis Ferranti meter says, we've sold it to someone. They said, yes, you sold it to us. We accepted your offer. And it went to court. And the court said, no, you didn't accept complete and unconditional. You introduced this new term about 30-day 30 30 delivery. And you also didn't pay the money into the right bank account. Now, if we ignore the wrong bank account as immaterial, the 30-day delivery was quite, quite important. It is a material term. And therefore, by introducing the material term, that is rejection of the original, replace it with a counteroffer. And now it's up to Ferranti meters whether they accept that counteroffer. And they didn't. Is that clear? Good. Offer must still be open at the time of acceptance. Hide and wrench. You know about hide and wrench. What was hide and wrench about? What was hide and wrench? Archers. Hide and wrench, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Two bad girlfriends. Two bad girlfriends. No, One bad girlfriend is enough. Offer. Took, back the offer, Took back the offer. No, he didn't take it back. Not hide and wrench. He didn't take his offer back. It was pushed back at him, but he didn't didn't take it back voluntarily. What's hide and wrench, Mara? Yulia. Mm, I'm just looking it up quickly. Hide and wrench, Ganuta. Hide and wrench, Sandra. Vita. Hide and wrench. It was rejection of an offer. What was the subject matter? Farm. Farm. The horse was probably on the farm. There was probably a horse involved and some sheep. It was a farm offered for a thousand pounds. It was rejected and replaced with a 950 offer. That was rejected. And then the original offer, he said, all right, I'll buy it for a thousand. And the original offer all said, no. Couldn't the buyer, the offeree, could not insist on buying it for a thousand. 